this year instead of making another resolution. Let's ask God to redeem our past, restore our present, rewrite our future. Remain in Jesus. Let's ask God to renew. This morning, we're going to talk about this idea of your future. We've talked about your past. We've talked about your present. But we're going to spend some time just really asking ourselves some questions, reflecting, uh, in a lot of ways, rewriting and maybe even reclaiming our future. Probably like you, I've had moments, my wife, my family have had moments where we were asking questions about our next step, uh, our future. What was it that was going to happen based on what was going on in our lives, what had happened in our lives, and how we could look into the future and see what God had. And in those moments, there was struggle. There was hopelessness. There was moments of, of unsure what was going to happen. And I'm going to share three of those moments with you this morning as we look also into God's word and we also look at three key words when it comes to rewriting and reclaiming the future that God has for you. But if you would, just join me in prayer as we set this time apart in holiness. God, we thank you for these moments. We can get into your word and find holiness and hope, and a heart for you. Be with us as we walk through and navigate the future of what you have for us, our families, our, our kids, and even this church. Be with us this morning. Allow us to hear and to see, allow your spirit to work in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. About three months into marriage, my wife and I were living in Cincinnati, Ohio. I was a youth pastor. Long story made very, very short. This was an amazing moment in our lives. But God allowed us to move from Cincinnati, Ohio to the deep south of Louisiana to take a church as a youth pastor. 17 hours away from her family, 24 hours away from my family driving. We were on an adventure. We had bright ideas and we had some cool things and God had done some amazing things to get us to that moment. And so now we are in this youth ministry in Southern Louisiana. We're understanding, we're getting to kind of get to know the culture. Youth ministry is starting to take off. We have students from the community coming in. We're seeing what God had laid out for us, what we, what we felt, what we knew, what we believed, what our plan was. About six months into us moving there, we were living in the church parsonage. We got a knock on the door. We opened the door. It was kind of late evening. And there was a senior pastor. He said, hey, can I come in? I want to talk to you about something. Sure. And as he walked in, we realized he was holding a big stack of Bibles and some papers. He sat down on our couch, placed the Bibles and these papers on our coffee table. And he said, hey, I just got to tell you something. We as a church leadership have sat down tonight and we talked about your youth ministry and we have voted on something that we want you to understand. We are a white church. We will remain a white church and that is not going to change. It is unacceptable that you have African American students coming to your ministry. We want you to know that we have a Bible and a list of appropriate African-American churches in our community. We want you to go to the homes of your African-American students that are attending your youth ministry and tell them they are no longer welcome in our church. Here's a Bible, and here's the appropriate places in our community for you to attend because you're not allowed in our building. We were shocked. I mean, our future... <laughs> What we thought was rocked. He stood up. He said, also, I want to let you know, I mean, if you continue to do youth ministry the way you're doing it, 
In our community, I and our church cannot guarantee your physical safety in our, in our community. And honestly, to be very real, those students, they're coming to your youth ministry, there's been some physical threats against those kids if they come back on our property. Talk about a moment where you were trying to figure out future. Barely a year into marriage, we began to pray. We began to seek God. We wanted to know what God had in store for us. And we made a choice that we were to stay faithful to God, what God had called us to, to godliness, and what we believed the Scripture taught to us about standing up and standing apart inside of culture around us. And we chose to renew our future by renewing our godliness, our holiness. We made a choice in that moment. That's the first thing I want to talk to you about this morning is if you are going to rewrite and reclaim your future, you need to seek to renew holiness. What does it look like for you in your life to live different than the culture you're living in? This is for students. This is for parents. This is for grandparents. This is for anyone in the room. If you want to see God show up in your future, it starts with you renewing your relationship with God and seeking holiness. We lived this difficult journey in our time at that church, but we chose to live in holiness. We, we really believe with our heart that God had placed us there for a reason. And I can tell you a lot more of that story some other time. God worked through our time there and continues to work in that church 20 plus years later. Not because of anything we did, but because of how God set us apart. Hopefully, it set a pattern of holiness in that place. So first thing is renewed holiness. I want to share one passage with you. It's in 1 Peter 1, 13 to 15. The NIV, if you have a Bible in front of you, grab that. If you have a phone, pull it out. But we want to, I just want to share with you a verse that God has laid on my heart this week about renewed holiness. It says this, Therefore, with minds that are alert and sober, set your hope on the grace brought to you when Jesus Christ was revealed at his coming. Therefore, with minds, some versions use the word prepare. With your minds prepared, changing your thinking, but getting your thinking ready for what is going to happen. Be alert and sober, which means be always ready, but also don't let anything influence you. Don't be on the, under the influence of anything else. Soberness is the opposite of letting something influence you. You're driving under the influence. You're doing something under the influence. What is influencing you? He says, no, if you're going to be holy, you need to be sober in what you are doing. He says, fix your hope. The word there, set, is the word fix. Your hope feels kind of broken in, this, in these moments. God says, look, fix your hope. Your hope is broken. You're not sure what the future holds. God says, set yourself. Fix your hope on the expectation of the kindness and grace that was brought to you when Jesus Christ came here. Your holiness is not about you. It's about your expectations, your focus on the person of Jesus Christ. Because he was revealed. The word there is to bring to light. Living in darkness, there was a great light. He brought us hope. He brought us holiness. He brought us a new way of seeing the world. Maybe you're living in this moment right now. Maybe you live in this moment in the past. We're trying to figure out who is that person you're going to marry someday, young people. 
Maybe it's trying to figure out college. Maybe it's trying to figure out a career. Maybe it's trying to figure out your retirement. Maybe it's trying to figure out something else. Your mindset, your thinking about that is going to be different if you choose a mindset of renewed holiness. Verse 14, as obedient children do not conform to the evil desires when you had lived in ignorance. Verse 15, but just as he has called you to be holy, so be holy in all you do. Verse 14, it says, as obedient ones who listen and obey, ones who listen and understand, be like children. And do not conform, Romans 12, 1 and 2, do not conform. Do not let anything shape your identity other than Jesus Christ. Because the evil desires, the lusts around you, I think about lust more sexually, but it's just, it's anything that you focus your desire on. Purity is a whole life thing. It's not just one particular area. That you've lived in ignorance the Greek word there is actually this cool word that we get the word agnostic. Don't live like an agnostic. Don't live in what you used to, the way you used to live. Knowing that maybe there's a possibility of a God, but I'm not going to live like there is a God. That's what the agnostic is. It's saying, yeah, maybe there's an opportunity, but no, I'm going to live differently. That's ignorant. That's the word here is the word we get agnostic. He says, no, you need to live like you know who the model of your life is. And it goes on, just as he has called you to be holy, the word there is to be set apart, to be different in all you do. We need holiness is an understanding that you need to stand up in the midst of a culture that doesn't really live that way and say, you know what? I have a future based on not those things, but on Christ and his promise for me, we live in these moments, these tension moments, then when we're trying to figure out what God has for our future. In the moment in our lives, we chose to live different. We chose to go back to the hope and the holiness of our lives. No, we're not going to live with any other influence. We're going to claim a future that's written and reclaimed in a lifestyle of holiness. If you want to see Christ in your life, if you want to see God's presence and guidance in your future, it starts with a lifestyle of holiness, of godliness. So often we can think of other things like, maybe if I do this and I do this, maybe I cheat here in my business, maybe I can get a better future here. Well, if I, if I do this and I do that, maybe I can get away with this in my, in my grades. Maybe I can get a better college scholarship because I got to do that. Maybe I can do these things and maybe I can get ahead of somebody else and find my future that way. And God says, no, no, don't have your future in unholiness. Have your future in me and in a different way of living and doing life. Put it up here on the screen. It says this, renewed holiness is renewed wholeness. Renewed wholeness, holiness is renewed wholeness. Getting back to all of who you need to be and all you should be. Renewed holiness is renewed wholeness. About four years ago, I was working at a church in Philadelphia and March came along, and a global pandemic struck our area. And honestly, our area was kind of hit hardest of the state of Pennsylvania first. And immediately, within a few couple days, everything started shutting down, including our church. And I had just got to that church. I had not been there very, very long. And I got pulled into the office with my boss and a campus pastor, a few people. And they said, we hired you expecting financially we would be a different place. 
We hired you for a position that we kind of weren't really quite ready for as a church, but we wanted to have you in this position. We were so excited for you to be here and for your team, but we can't afford you. And we're not really sure how long this thing is going to last. Hopefully it was only a couple months, but we need to lay you off. Our church can't financially support all the staff and all the campuses that we have. We need to lay you off. My wife was laid off from her job. Our kids had just been gone to online schooling. I came home to sit my wife down and tell her that I was being laid off. And then I had to sit down with our kids and say, I'm getting laid off. Dad doesn't have a job, and I'm probably not going back to the church. And, and so we had this moment of going, what do we do? My kids have been through some transitions at this point in their lives. And Jenna and Caleb, my kids said, hey, we're going to go for a walk. We'll be right back. Oh, okay. We need to talk. And they walked out. They just walked off, left Melissa and I sitting in the, in the house just talking and hanging out a little bit. A little while later, Jenna and Caleb walked back into the house and they said, you know what? We've been praying. We've been talking. Um, we don't think we are done as a family in youth, in youth ministry and family ministry. We want you to continue doing what you do. We don't want you to stop. We are called as a family to serve families. We are called as a family to do what God's calls to do. So we think, you and mom can talk, but we, we're in. If you want to start, keep interviewing. If you want to find a new place, we're ready to go. Because that's what God has called our family to do. So later on, pretty much nothing was open. I mean, it was Walmart and a, and a grocery store. In the grocery store, we f- discovered the beautiful thing that they had a Starbucks, and it was still open. So this is a miracle. You know, we talk about God sightings. There was a Starbucks, the only Starbucks in the whole entire area that was still open. You know, my wife likes her Starbucks. God's got to get a Starbucks, you know. So we jump in the car. We go to the grocery store, get the supplies we need, you know, toilet paper, hand sanitizer, and, of course, some Starbucks. That's the essentials, right? So we go to the local grocery store, one of the few places that's open for a limited time. As we're walking into the grocery store, we see a sign that says, overnight stockers are needed immediately. So my wife is getting her Starbucks. I walk over to the store manager and say, hey, I've been laid off. I need a job. What do you got? And they're like, they gave me a quick on the spot interview and said, start two days from now. And for the next three months, I worked from 11 to 7, six days a week, stocking shelves at a local grocery store with a very colorful group of people, uh, very unique people, all night long, very bizarre people. But I had this opportunity. <laughs> uh, Woo! I can say some stories. That's another story. But I had these moments with these people throughout the night to share my faith. Because they found out that I was a pastor, and they're like, hey, pastor. And they asked me some random question about God or things. And they kept like, we don't get it, though. Like, you should be mad. Like, we're mad at church. You should be mad at church, too. You work there. No, no, that's not how this works. I, I love what I do, and I, I'm doing this to support my family. And they're like, this is amazing. And I had these moments of quiet, freezing in the, in the freezer, stocking milk by myself, or sitting in an aisle by myself, stocking hand sanitizer and, and toilet paper, listening to podcasts, listening to worship. And what I realized is that as I questioned and prayed over my next step, my future, my wife and I prayed over our next steps, our future. We, we talked to our kids about what God had next. It was a heart thing. It 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 wasn't just a hard work thing. It was a heart thing. If we're going to find God's future and rewrite it and reclaim it, we need to have a renewed hustle. Not just hard work. I'm using the word hustle because it's a heart thing. It's an attitude thing. God is going to bless your future when your attitude and your heart mindset comes out in what you do and the work you put in. 
We sometimes live in this mindset that we can just kind of hang out at our house and eventually somebody's going to knock on our door and they're going to have a publisher clearinghouse check for us. We're going to buy that scratcher and magically we're going to be a millionaire. For some young people, I'm going to leave in my basement, play video games, be on Twitch, and someone's going to give you a million dollars because I know how to be an influencer on TikTok. I don't, that's not God's calling our lives for your future. So for young people, I'm sorry to break your heart. You are never going to be a millionaire from doing TikTok and Twitch. For us who are older generation, the likelihood of you winning the lottery, not very much. So instead, God has called us to work, to put forth an attitude to make sure that our work and our actions are honoring to him so that he can honor us with his future. Second verse I want to share with you is Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. I love this verse. It says this, Whatever you do, work as if with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. In context, this is written to a group of slaves, literally Roman slaves. And he's saying, hey, in this new way of doing Christian life, these, these slaves were getting saved. They're coming to Christ, but still living and working, honoring what they were called to do in their life, which is they were slaves. He says, even as a slave, you need to live this way with a heart and a hustle for life. He says, whatever you do, whatever make, whatever work, the actions of your lives, do it with all of your breath and soul. Breath and soul. Live your life in a way that your hustle is seen by others as it is knowing that you are not doing this for others, you are doing this for God. Your work, your hustle. But what it does, it comes out in a witness to the people who are your human masters. In this case, for them, they literally were looking at slave masters. He says, whoever that is that you're feel like, some of us are slaving away. God says, no, no, you're not doing this for them. You're doing it for me. Your testimony is your hard work, your heart, your attitude. Since you know you're being shaped, that you receive an inheritance. He's talking to slaves. He's saying, look, you're living in this household. You're not part of that family, but you're working for them. But understand, if you work as if to me, you are part of my family. The inheritance, the reward that you will see in the future is about me owning you as my son and my daughter. The attitude changes when you start looking at your life currently and the things that you're doing, the work you're doing with a hustle heart attitude. I'm not doing this just to make a living. I'm not just doing this to get ahead of my career. I'm doing this to honor God. In my heart, hustle changes. For the Lord as a reward, for it is the Lord Christ you are serving. You are now a bond servant. It goes from slave to bond servant. Slave was just this lowly kind of like, all right, you're slave, you're, I own you, to I now I'm working for you because I owe you something. I owe you a bill. There's two different kinds of, of enslavement at that time. He says, no, no, you're not just a, you're not a slave, you're a bond servant. You're now serving me because we are doing this together. And you see Christ as the one who is part of your life. Renewed hustle is renewing your heart. Renewing your hustle is renewing your heart. And that's what sets your future in motion. I was working at a church in a red side of D.C. And D.C. is a little bit different culture working there because our church had year-to-year -year contracts. It wasn't like you got hired and you stayed hired. You would every year would get a review. They would talk about it. And very much like military culture, military contractors, you would get a new contract for the new year based on what needed to be done for that new year. That's how the church ran. It was very odd for some people, but that's how it ran. And we kind of knew that coming in, 
And they said, don't worry about it, it's just part of our culture here. But our second year, I was informed that my contract would not be renewed. That I would not fit into the next steps for the church. They were doing some different things, nothing negative. It was just simply, this is the church, where, this is what we're going, and we're not doing, they were doing some things differently. And so each part, one of us had to go around and find out whether or not we got a contract based on what was the next thing. Very military, very cut and dry. But we found out that I was not going to be renewed in my contract. So the end of June, exactly to the day I was hired, two years after, I was done. And the way the culture works there is rents happen year to year based on the fact thing that everybody has military contracts or you're working for the military, work for the government. So our landlord is gracious, but he simply said, we can't keep you unless you're willing to sign a whole another year contract, you're going to your lease with us. So a month later, the end of July, we took everything we owned, put them in two pods, and shipped them away to a warehouse. What we had left, a few changes of clothes, a few items that we felt were valuable, a few key things for our kids to play with, some toys, some things, some favorite things, we packed in our two cars. And we became homeless for two months. We lived with family, we visited family, we lived in hotels, we had a gracious, wonderful friend of ours. There was a retiring colonel from the Air Force. He said, hey, we're going on a vacation to celebrate my retirement. You can live in our house for a few weeks. We had another friend, a part of our church. One of the passion staff said, hey, you can come live with us for a bit. But for two months, essentially, we were without a house. Most of our belongings were shipped away to a warehouse, and we lived from place to place. And in those moments, it was really hard to find hope for a future. It was really hard on our kids. Sleeping on a floor, all of us sharing a bedroom at moments, sharing a hotel room at moments, talking to my wife about our future, what my God might have for us next. What did it look like for us? And so we had a moment for about two months where we really had to claim holiness and a heart of hustle, but we had to find hope. And God was good to us. God has always been good to us. And over and over again, we found renewed hope through friendships, through opportunities through places to live. We never went hungry. We never had to live physically on the street, even though we were going from place to place for two months. Your future is found in a renewed heart for God, holiness, a renewed hustle, but also renewed hope. I, I challenge you to look, continually to look for the hope you can have in Christ. That is what sustained us as we looked in moments of what is our future look like? How do we reclaim and rewrite what we're not seeing, but we want to see because of our relationship with Jesus Christ? Renewed hope is essential for us to find our future. 2 Corinthians 4, 16-18. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18, talks to us about having renewed hope. So that you may not lose heart, though the outer self is wasting away, or your inner self is being, while well, your inner self is being renewed day by day. So that you may not lose heart. The word there is a word that actually means poisoning. You are slowly being poisoned. Poison. Don't let yourself slowly be poisoned, but in your inner self feels like you're decaying, you're wasting away. Know that your inner self, who you are on the inside, is continually to be remade, renewed. You are being renewed. In those moments when your mind, your heart, your hope 
Your holiness feels like it's being poisoned. Return back to the inner hope you have, even though outside feels like you're getting beat up. Feels like this is hopelessness. This is no, no, find your hope day by day. It literally means sunset to sunrise. Every day, every sunrise to sunset, find hope. That's the literal best way to translate what is being written. For the light momentary inflictions being pressed down. You have a little bit of light pressure. You're feeling like you're being pressed down. I can't do this. I'm not sure if I can do it anymore. You feel that light pressure of what am I going to do? What does my future look like? Is preparing us for the eternal weight of glory beyond comparison. The light weight versus the heaviness of eternity. The word there is a Greek word that actually we get a word barometric pressure or barometric from. You feel a little light pressure, don't, don't worry about it because all of eternity is around you like a barometer, like the barometric pressure of your world. That is heaven. The hope of heaven saturates everything around you. Those light little moments of pressure are nothing compared to all of the glory of heaven wrapped around you like a barometer of pressure around you. This is the weight of heaven. It lifts us. It gives us hope so that you may see this mo- the glory, the thinking and appearing beyond, which means to throw something. How far can you throw your hope? Is nothing compared to the comparison. The word there is ballistic. You throw it a little bit, or there is a power to come as we look, contemplate, not the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. It is the timeline of infinity. Your hope is not found in earthly things. It's found in the hope of heaven. When Christ talked about the kingdom of heaven, he was not talking about heaven above. He was talking about our life today that comes in every single day. We live in the hope of heaven every single day. We have the opportunities to rewrite and reclaim our future by renewed hope in a renewing of our understanding of heaven. We have the opportunities to see our future through our holiness, through our attitude of heart and hustle, but also to see it through our hope. We have hope that goes beyond the earthly things that are happening to us right now. We have hope that goes far beyond the light little pressures. We have hope that surround us, that weighs us down with glory, that takes over our lives. I put this up on the screen just so you can see and understand this. It says this, the holiness and hustle of our earthly lives comes as we look forward in hope for our future eternity in heaven. We have the opportunity to reclaim our future. We have an opportunity to reset our future. We have an opportunity to rewrite our lives. The holiness and hustle of our earthly lives comes as we look forward in hope for our future eternity in heaven. I'm not sure what is going on in your individual lives in your lives with your marriage, your lives with your kids, the lives you look to the future of your career, for young people in the room, as you look to the next step in your school, whether it be high school, college, graduating from college and going into a career, I want to give you hope that God has you and he knows the plans he has for you. Your opportunity is to turn to him in holiness, to give your whole heart to him and to live with hope in him. We have hope. 
Christ gives us hope for our lives, hope for our relationships, hope for what we have next. And it's never going to change. And no matter what, we can look to the glory of heaven, knowing this is only temporary, but we will spend eternity living with his holiness, with his hope, living connected to his heart forever. Let's pray. God, we claim our earthly holiness and hustle right now. We, the things that we're going through allow us to take and live lives earthly, day in and day out, sunrise to sunset in holiness. Allow us to live every day, giving our absolute best to you, working because you are our God. But God, allow us to continue to keep our eyes not on earthly things, but on heaven above, that we have hope for glory in heaven with you. Renew our past, renew our present, renew our view of the future. Be with us as we reflect on you in communion. Be with us as we worship you and adore you because you have given us this life beyond compare. In Jesus' name, amen.